what I've done, and I, you know, so that's the list of terms, whoa, you know, disturbingly long. I'll come back to that in just a second. On the flip side, on your flip side, are three essay questions. And the reason why I do this exam as quickly as I do is that these three topics hold together really nicely. And the next section is going to be almost all foreign policy. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea in there, obviously. And those topics hold together very nicely. These are all, all three of these topics, populism, progressivism, and Great Depression New Deal, are what happens when America embraces this idea of industrial capital. Right? Um, if you, reach, you, you get the populist, and again, all three of these questions, what I would suggest when people come in and talk to me, I say, use your common sense, you're intelligent, rely on it, right? What's going on in America during this period of time? What's going on is that you have this debate in terms of what is happening with American society and um, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of reacting to these economic changes. So you've got three questions here. Two of these will be on the exam, exactly as worded. You will answer one of them. You know what? If there's one question on here that you don't like, ignore it. It won't, even if it's on the exam, you can answer the other one. So right out of the gate, you can already say, is the game a number? Zip, I'm not looking at that one, right? You probably don't want to completely ignore the terms associated with that, but what you've got here are basically two questions you need to prep for. Um, one of which we're going to finish up, up today, which is, which is progressive, right? So in studying this, there are multiple ways in which people do it. What, I, what you've got here are three big picture significance big questions over here. And then a list of terms on the flip side. And if you'll notice, I got these little marks on mine. Whoa, the secret answers? No. If you put a line under the presidential election of 1896, right, between social gospel progressives and the presidential of 1896, draw a line. Everything above presidential election of 1896 is dealing with question one populism. And study them together. How do those terms work to answer the essay question? How does the essay question give you a sense of significance to the terms? I'm a basketball fan. I like NCAA, right? Team 64 eventually ends up at four, you know, four final teams. And it's sort of the same relationship. These are the building blocks in which the essay question can be answered. And so if you're studying the terms as evidence for the essay question, and the essay question as significance for the terms, it kind of comes together, right? That's the better way to study for an exam like this. The other is, I'm gonna start the first one, I'm gonna go online, I'm gonna find out what it says, I'm gonna to go to the next one, you won't remember. It, does, it just it doesn't have any context, and so there's no connection that, um, you know, you need a good original memory, so you may be better than that. Okay, so presidential election of 1896, everything including that above it is all uh, popular. Yeah, populism, question number one. Henry Ford and Herbert Hoover, gotta separate those two guys on the second. Uh, column. Everything from social gospel progressives to Henry Ford is basically a term related to this topic of progressivism. Right? Again, same thing. Use those terms to study the essay. Use the essay to put context around the terms. And then the last one, Herbert Hoover down to Huey Long, are all going to be dealing with the Great Depression. All right? This is the best way in which to understand history, not as a set of, this is the exact answer but an argument that needs evidence for you to make, right? And these questions are open-ended enough where it gives you the opportunity to be able to say, here's what I think, here's how I read it, right? And while maybe easier to follow, uh, maybe easier to follow Blanche's argument in class, I'm not gonna take points off because you disagree with me. I thought it was down like it, but nonetheless, right? Um, when you get a question, you saw that in the first example, why? Right? It is an open-ended, you know, you have plenty of opportunity to frame that question how you want to frame that, but the responsibility is on you to be able to make an argument. All right? So I'm giving you the opportunity to make that argument in a broader way. Other questions, and I'm trying to look here, I think uh, um, question number one is a little more specific. Okay? Here's this, here's that, here's the other. So whichever you're more comfortable. Yeah, question. Um, what section is he in? Which one? Oh yeah, um, the lines that I suggested for the first question on populism basically includes the spoil system all the way down to presidential election 1996. Draw a line under, underneath 1996. From social gospel, and it's two columns, all the way down to Settlement House, and you start with Teddy Roosevelt, and you go down to Henry Ford. 
is the entrance question, okay? For the line under the report, and we'll talk about it today, um, as an example of, of progressives. And then what we'll be doing Monday, Wednesday of next week are, are the remaining terms, okay? I give this to you not because you're gonna spend a boatload of time this weekend kind of prepping for an exam on Friday, but to give you a sense of looking through this and use your common sense. What are the terms that I spent time in class talking about? How did I talk about them? How did I use them as evidence to make an argument? And use that as the framework upon which you're gonna build your own ideas. Again, mirror my own, it would be very different. But, but that's the evidence that's, that's available to be able to do that, right? You can go off and if you want to answer progressivism in a different way not using this material, that's fine too. Right? There's all kinds of evidence, right? on which I will kind of come back to as we get closer to the more modern stuff. All right, so I just want to make sure you get that in your hands over the weekend. If you can't spend time, if you do have questions about the terms, if you have questions, more importantly, look over your last exam and see where you did well and where you didn't do as well as you thought you might. That's the real critical thing, learning your own proclivities in regards to being an intellectual. Right? You're intellectual, so now I have to say that quietly, but you don't produce anything but ideas. Um, so your own strengths and weaknesses as a writer, as a, as a historian, et cetera. Um, and if you got questions, either see me or my office hours or bring them in. Uh, usually, again, I don't want to pre, but usually if you did well, as I said before, when I handed back the first exam, if you were 85 or better on the first exam, you're going to still do well. Um, the ones who I worry about are the ones who had online technology and aren't going to have that sitting in class and think that significance is just telling me more about something. Right? Henry Ford's birthday was in, you know, this day, his favorite color is green, and none of that is, is worth the time that you're taking here as a college student. Thinking about it, the significance is worth that time. Okay, so we'll leave in, a little, little present for the weekend. No Super Bowl to worry about. All right, so what I did last time was to work through, and I made that point of saying there's these three types of progressives, right? So here we are, the progressivism defined social gospel, national, and corporate liberals. And I spend the majority of the time talking about social gospel, largely not because they're harder to understand, but they're just a more diverse group. My idea of an ethical treatment is different than your idea of an ethical treatment. And I think I concluded when I was talking about national progressives, welcome well, back to this with Teddy Roosevelt, right? But social gospel progressives, in essence, see these problems, create an organization to deal with it, and in essence, change the environmental conditions that exist. The best single example is Jane Addams, right? She sees a problem with women as caregivers, as biologically required to uh, incubate and, and deliver children, as having an economic consequence to their lives, and she goes in and changes the environmental uh, conditions that exist, provides daycare and not sorry and all that kind of stuff, right? So the social gospel's got nothing to do with running for Congress or anything like that. They will, as we're gonna see, form advocacy groups, NAACP, National, you know, National Rifle Association, et cetera, but they're not directly political parties. They are going to kind of play into that. And then I just switched over to national progressives, the second major side, much easier to understand. Congressmen, senators, um, presidents, Eddie Roosevelt, who inherits the presidency in 1901, is sort of a poster child for this. This young, energetic, optimistic, Again, why wouldn't you be energetic and optimistic? He's the son of a millionaire. <laughs> Pretty easy. You know, oh, yeah, well, okay, here's, here's a million dollars. Go do what you want. Oh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic. So there is this sort of inherent bias that comes with who are these people and what they reflect. The so Roosevelt is, in essence, very much like the people we saw following the, sec the, the uh, Civil War of saying, here's the Constitution of the United States. It says certain things. And what it says is that you're an American citizen. You don't have to ask for these rights. You don't have to ask for a trial by jury. You don't have to ask for um, you know, Second Amendment rights. You don't have to ask for due process. Those are guaranteed. But within those guarantees are certain assumptions about what the federal government must do to protect those rights. Right? And it's here where, I didn't focus on this last time, but it's here where you begin to see if you're in law and legal kind of definitions. What was the original intent of the framers of the Constitution? What did they mean by the First Amendment? What did they mean by the Seventh Amendment? I'm not sure what the Seventh Amendment is right now, right? What did they mean, but what, 
Is the 14th Amendment intended for citizens or is it simply intended for freedmen during uh, the 1860s and 1870s? Right? These kind of debates are taking place at the national level. And I made the point of using it as an example, particularly Roosevelt, uh, you know, a young president, inherits the presidency, the economy's in bad shape, it's starting to come out of, of a recession, when you have this threat of a national coal strike. And Roosevelt simply says, listen, I'm not going to take the sides of the union, I'm not going to take the sides of the owners, but I am going to force you to, to come to some resolution. Because I'm not going to let your local problem, your debate over you know, working conditions and hourly wage, shut down the national economy. And I have the constitutional power as chief executive to do that. That's a national progressive, that's a federal progressive, everyone kind of see that. And he gets this reputation as a trust buster, and I know I talked about IBM and, and AT&T here. Um, Teddy is a lot of bombast, he's a lot of talk, he's a lot of big headlines and all the rest of that stuff. His successor, William Howard Taft, is actually the guy who's gonna break up most of these monopolies. Um, they're all based on competition arguments, whether or not, again, IBM is big, you don't break it up because there are competitors. You can buy other things in IBM. AT&T is big, there is no competitor to AT&T. They're the only ones at the time who control long distance lines. Right? And so that's what the antitrust is sort of sort of focused on. And I did, I know I concluded here on an example that was close to Teddy Sardi's now. Doris Winnie, he's a hunter. Again, if you're an environmentalist, you should go buy a hunter or somebody, again, I'm not a hunter, go buy him a cup of coffee because all are or fishermen, because those licensing fees are what pays to maintain a lot of this environmental stuff. Okay? Roosevelt cares about this. Hundreds and thousands of millions of acres are going to be set aside permanently from federal development, from private ownership, because he looks at this and says, we have to conserve this as a component of what America once was, right? This is our natural heritage, and it is worth preserving that for, or, uh, for people who are going to you know, come, come after us. If you are in a strict environmental, Sierra Club, again, the founder is, is John Muir, this guy standing right here, his, his argument is no, it's ethical, more ethical to simply preserve it. Don't change anything, don't, 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 you know, don't allow anyone to come in, and, I mean, obviously you can come in, but don't allow them to make any transfer, any changes in logging and mining and whatnot. So again, you have the same kind of moral, ethical conundrum of what's right, what's good. What's proper? Who do you trust? Who, what, what experts are you going to listen to? And if you, once you get the federal government making arguments for land set-asides, right, what's to stop them logically in terms of the concepts here of doing the same for minimum wage and these other issues? It opens the door to say, in essence, the federal government is the proper place to debate these issues. Not the Corpus Christi Chamber of Commerce, not the you know, Fort Lauderdale mayoralty or something like that. The American citizens under the Constitution have rights, and those rights ultimately supersede any other rights you have as members of people living within the, the boundaries of the United States of America. But they're the ones who are going to ultimately have that right. The political process, as I mentioned, is dominated by Republicans. Again, don't try and force fit Republican. Oh, oh, it's the same thing. No, it's not. I right? you sound foolish if you try and make that argument. Right? These guys are not even Lincoln Republicans anymore. That's 30 years. Right? It's a completely different story. But the Republican Party is going to dominate the national. They're the ones who are going to make this argument for progressivism. You know, I mean, it's again, it's historians. You kind of roll your eyes when you hear these people. Oh, progressives. It's like, dude. Yeah, it always is, right? You know, it's a, just understand that history changes, that people in generational uh, changes have different different understandings. Roosevelt inherits the presidency in 1901. Um, he is going to run for election slash re-election in 1904, win arguably the greatest landslide, or the most lopsided landslide in American history. And on election night, he is going to say, I am going to observe a tradition set by George Washington of not running too heavy two terms. I refuse to run for re-election. I don't think he's 50 years of age yet. And he's effectively said, my political career is over. Now, this is a guy who is always interested in being in the midst of things. He's always interested in being active politically. Um, he 
He has a hand-picked successor, William Howard Tapp, first sitting president to visit Corpus Christi, by the way. Um, comes down here to go fishing. Yeah, when he had Marlin and whatnot. Um, um, and it's the Taft administration who sort of settles down. He's not as bombastic. He's not as, you know, headline seeking. But it's Taft's administration who is going to put into law, maybe not implement, all of these things that we've been talking about, a direct income tax. If you are making money in this country, you owe an obligation to the country for the production of that wealth. Direct election of senators, child labor, you know, tariff reduction, by the way. Up until 2016, every Republican on the planet would say tariffs are a bad thing. Last Republican president, again, not discussed, not a part of normal tell, has flipped that on, this, on its head. There's now tariffs. We are now taking your money as consumers and using it to benefit um, uh, industry. Okay? So again, these, these issues, throughout the 20th century, we were a tariff, at least the Republican Party, conservatives would say tariffs are the worst possible thing you can do to mess with the marketplace, et cetera. When you look at these, you know, where have we first seen this? direct election of senators, it's not a gold issue here. The populists, this is the same thing the populists were arguing in the 1890s, those pissed off farmers, right? And they were saying there needs to be reform. By the time you get to the 1910s, the mainstream political parties have taken this up as their own issue. So there is this evolution, there is this connection between populism and progressivism, and then as we're gonna see the New Deal. Um, in, in 1912, uh, Taft is president, he's heir, heir apparent, he would have won uh, re-election quite easily, but Teddy Roosevelt returns from Africa and he wants to, wants to run for president again. The Republican Party has something called primaries now, and the Democrats do as well. Well, they're primaries, well, everyone in the room knows what primaries are, but they're a brand new progressive reform. Let's let the people of the states nominate our candidates. And the Republicans hold seven primaries, I forgot what states, even uh, Taft's own home state of Ohio, and Roosevelt wins them all. Right? So the, Republic, the Republican public voters all want to see Roosevelt back in office. They all want to see Teddy back in office. The party basically puts the end to this. Oh, hang on, we're not going to do this. Thing. The party says, well, we're not going to no nominate Teddy Roosevelt. We're going to nominate William R. Taft. We're going to nominate the sitting Republican president. And so the Republican Party itself sort of splits in terms of its own leadership. Roosevelt is not going to take that line down. Roosevelt forms his own progressive party. Uh, the, the symbol is the bull moose, kind of classic Teddy. While he's announcing the formation of the bull moose party in Milwaukee, he's shot and the would-be assassin shoots him. He goes through a speech, which is in his pocket, and literally pierces his blood, pierces his body, but doesn't doesn't go any further. Sounds like a flesh wound. He gives the speech while he's standing up there with a bullet kind of cooling in his chest. Right, classic Teddy Roosevelt. Um, man, on it, bull moose, bully, all that kind of stuff. What it does is clearly separate the two parties, right? Or the political party, the Republican Party. It's a two-party system. The Republican Party is now split, and you cannot win an election when you have split your party. In a two-party system don't work that way. Works great if you have a, have a parliamentary system. If you're like every other democracy on the planet, you want to have multiple parties. Not here. We want two parties. It forces the voters to make that compromise. Some people aren't willing to do that. And as a result, and Eugene Debs, who's now running as a socialist, a real socialist, right? Uh, he's going back. It's socialism, right? Kind of thing. I go away with my pants. I know, whatever. Um, the Democrats nominate Woodrow Wilson. They originally wanted to nominate uh, good old William Jennings Bryan for a fourth try. But I think even, even old you know, Bill was like, no, nah, not again. I, I'll take my whooping. Um, William Jennings Bryan actually nominates Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Wilson is a Southerner. Um, he's an academic. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but Wilson is going to get the nomination of the Democrats, and being the only non-divided party is going to win the election. The only reason the Democrats are going to win throughout this period of time is because the Republicans split in two. The same thing could be argued when we get to the 1968-2008 period of time. The only reason Bill Clinton wins is because they run two Republicans. The only reason Jimmy Carter wins is because the previous president was a crook um, and America wanted to punish the Republicans as a result of Richard Nixon. So these periods of time where you have this swing, these swings, are pretty strong and are pretty firm in terms of the political alliances that are there. 
Wilson is president during the First World War as a result. I mean, one of his first statements is president. Wouldn't it be ironic if, because he's, he's not a foreign president. Wouldn't it be ironic if foreign policy was meaningful to me? Um, Wilson is in many ways the perfect description of a progressive. He's moralistic, so he's very, he's, he's very much tied. He was a theology major, political science uh, as, as his discipline. President of Princeton University, which is still a, a theological school, uh, kind, of, kind of links there. Uh, real strong moral views of right and wrong, which are gonna lead him to all kinds of problems as a politician. My advice is never, ever, ever elect an academic. <laughs> We're really good at doing research and making arguments and all that kind of stuff. We're really bad at kind of compromise, and that's what politics is all about. Saying, well, you gotta compromise on this. Oh no, I'll just put another footnote in here. Right? Woodrow Wilson is all of that. But what Wilson does is in essence take what is an active progressive agenda and put it into practice, put it into law. Right? And so again, the child labor law, graduated income tax, these are not brand new issues that Woodrow Wilson is going to bring into office, what he's going to do is going to put them into practice. The one you see outlined here, the Federal Reserve Act, is usually the one, again, all the conspiracy theories about the Federal Reserve and Jews, right? Jews everywhere. The Federal Reserve is a group of private banks, private, not government owned. And what they do and what they are going to do next week is that they meet together, there's a Federal Reserve System which says, how much money should we circulate into the economy? And if the economy is suffering from inflation, we need to turn the temperature down. It's getting too hot, too much money is circulating around. We need to make it harder to gain access to money. Up goes the interest rates. If we're in an, a period of recession or depression, we need to make money available. People need to be able to have money to spend. Because if you don't have money to spend, then the people selling stuff don't sell stuff, and they start laying people off, right? So the Federal Reserve is simply, it's a damper, right? It's, it's if you have a stove, you open and close the, the air that's access to it. I always think in terms of automobiles, it's the carburetor. Your carburetor's clock car, what the hell's a carburetor? The carburetor is the way it regulates the air flow and the mixture of the gas. If you have, if you allow more oxygen into an engine, it is going to burn hotter. That's what the Federal Reserve is. It's not government control. I mean, sure as hell isn't a Jewish conspiracy. They got space lasers anymore, right? Okay. No, I don't know. Um, so, so he serves, Wilson serves as sort of this culmination of a period of time that World War I is effectively going to stop. So World War I is going to change the bearing of the United States. And we'll pick up and look at this after the, this next exam. We're gonna look at foreign policy in terms of the United States. Um, what, what, what emerges in global context is suddenly, increasingly, industrial countries are shutting down trade, are making it harder to trade, and as a result, it, it has direct effects on, on these economies. Right? They're using the federal government to do what? To try and put some barriers around where the tiger can go. It's saying the tiger can't eat children; they got to go to school. The tiger has to have some sense of compensation for the damage it does and the, and the goods that it produces, right? It is not designed to help the little guy. Roosevelt did not recognize their union. Roosevelt did not step in and go, workers of the world unite, right? When we get to the New Deal, it does not aid the average American. It doesn't, right? Don't believe me, look at this, plenty of scholarship out there. Well, you know, get off YouTube and, and, and go look at this stuff. This is not socialism, there is socialism out there. It's very clear, Eugene Debs, hi, here's socialism. What is being enacted here is not socialism. It is not an argument that says we're going to have production means and the production are gonna be controlled by the federal government. They're gonna make connections with those social gospel progressives that are going to form coalitions. And here's where you see the stability of the two-party system. The two-party system is going to be based on your interest groups on whether and if and who you're gonna bring into this. So by the time we get to the 1930s, really the late 1920s, a Roosevelt, his cousin, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Democrat, is going to define a group of people who are very, very different, right? But they are held together in a coalition, right? A Trump Republican, whatever, you know, uh, Reagan Republican, Obama Democrat. 
They're made up of all kinds of coalitions. They're not made up of a, of a uniform, as much as the media will do, uniform idea of this is who they are. Again, the federal government is now the location and has been since the progressive era of this debate. Right? Governors and Senate, whatever, governors and, and you know, particularly governors, but uh, you know, state representatives, oh, it's all about this. It isn't. It is not, right? The power, the economics, the regulatory agencies, et cetera, are, all have, Supreme Court is rule, all have supreme stake of what goes on in terms of American industry. Um, you know, all the bluster about, oh, we're going to do it our way, fine, um, see you in court, because that's usually when it, when it begins to, to kind, of, kind of shut down, right? Two types, of, three types of progressives, we've done, number one, social gospel, number two, national, the third one is not oxymoron, corporate liberal progressives, and really what this image is trying to show is something I talked about at the end of the, the, the 19th century, and that is, what started as industrial capitalism was in large part something that was predicated on how much work can we get out of the least prepared people, the least um, capable of defending their own rights. How much can we force an immigrant family of five to sit around and make paper flowers all day for, pen, for pennies, for, you know, for, for, for slave wages? That is not the kind of industry. This may be kind of early 1870s, 1880s. This is more like the industry that exists by the time you get to the 20th century. You're like the General Electric plant that you saw, the Westinghouse plant that you saw. Um, this is an automobile, this is soon to be General Motors, not yet General Motors, but it's soon to be uh, General Motors, actually a, a Buick plant. Um, these are complex issues. How do you make an automobile, right? You have a lot of complex parts. How do you make an air conditioner? How do you make a computer? How do you make a cell phone? Right? Those things take time. They take skill or semi-skill. Whatever this guy is doing right here, it takes some time and skill to be able to figure that out. It is not the case with these people over here, easily replaced. And increasingly, corporations and capitalists are going to look and say, you know what? It is in our interest. We don't want unhappy workers. We don't want crazy workers, Charlie Chaplin workers. We want to have workers who are at least willing to come into work and put in a good day's work and not unions to come in and tell us what to do or the government to come in and tell us what to do. We will be progressive, but we will do it on our own. And if it sounds like the origins of kind of modern conservatism, and I'm not, again, hold your powder, right? There's cultural conservatism, which is what we have today. There's kind of organic or modern conservatism. And, and I'm sympathetic to it. Again, I mean, define me as a conservative, define me as a liberal. I don't care which, right? It doesn't matter to me, whatever you call it, right? Modern conservatism basically argues that your personal property is one of your inalienable rights. You're born with life, liberty, and property. And you better have a damn good reason for taking away any of those. And a corporate liberal is going to say, we're the ones who've invested billions to make Ford Motor Company. And we're the ones who are going to say, or have a right to say, we understand that our workers are critical to the success of our company. We're going to see an example of that. You, the public, have no rights in that regard. And it sounds like an abortion question, right? You know, we'll get back to that later on, right? Yeah, you know, I have my personal body. You don't have any rights to say what I do with my personal, or, or a vaccine kind of thing. In this case, it's not life or liberty, it's property, right? Believe the basis for compromise is efficiency. What's the best use of our money? If it's better to have a minimum wage, fine, we'll have a minimum wage. But we think it's better if we have an internal reward structure. If we say to people, this is why you're working for us. This is what we'll do. It is highly individualized. And again, the ones at the turn of the century who have a complete leg up are those who are already native born male, you know the routine. The ones who have a kind of an assumed superiority in American society, in world society, quite honestly. Um, Quite far away, but nonetheless. So, who are these people? They are a smaller subset, but they are in large part in charge of or have control of large subsets of the economy. Right? And they are going to come up with a terminology that, if you're not in class, you're not writing this down, you're not listening in terms of, you will miss on the next exam. You see it every semester, right? Welfare capitalism. Well, it's a son of a bitch, is doing welfare, and you know, if you will feed him, they'll breed him, all that kind of crap. 
who introduces the idea that says you're going to be taken care of because we're in a complex industrial capitalist society? It ain't government. It ain't people of color. It's not unions. Unions are all about a fair day's wage and a fair day's labor. Right? It's capitalists. What they're going to say is that if you play by our rules, if you show up at 8 o'clock when the bell rings, when the horn rings, if you pay attention to you know, making sure the productivity is done, again, mentally, in my mind, I have the Charlie Chaplin, the two, you know, I'm in a Charlie Chaplin clip, I should, if you're willing to stand there for eight hours a day and doing that, you're doing what we want you to do, we're gonna make sure you're gonna succeed in American society. We're going to help you by doing things like creating a savings account for you at work, by helping you invest in the stock market, real ownership in stock, 401k plans, help you with the development of putting out a down payment on property. All the things that an a capitalism rewards, property ownership, capital development, productivity. You don't have to go to the government. You shouldn't want to go to the government. You show up and do what we ask you to do and we're going to make sure you're going to be good middle class Americans. This emerges at the turn of the century. They're the ones who start this argument. And if you're sitting there in a Charlie Chaplin job with the wrenches and don't go crazy and you've done this for 18, 20 years and you're getting a good salary and all of a sudden what happens, the Great Depression happens, and you and your brother and your entire family's life is wiped out as a result of this, you're going to assume that this is still in play. It isn't, right? When the Great Depression hits, and I don't blame them for it, the tiger's on your tiger's, I'm not going to continue to feed you, right? They're not in the business of losing money. And so businesses are going to step away from this when we get to the Great Depression, which makes sense. But notice that in essence, one of the things, the greatest thing that's changed in the 20th century is that businesses in the 21st don't give a shit if you're an American citizen, good American citizenship or not. I don't care if you save money. I don't care if you have money. Right? Work. And if you don't work, then I'll fire you. Right? That's the biggest change that's taken place in my lifetime, in the 60 years that I've been here, as we're going to see when we get to finance capital. Right. Poster child for this is Henry Ford. I, I've done a lot of research on or the moon. I wrote a book a couple of years back. Um, just FYI, so you know, History Channel has a bunch of stuff. It's you know, a lot of World War II, a lot of car. So there's a series of uh, cars made America, and I'm, I'm all over it. I'm a big one of the talking heads in there. A friend of mine from California, and talked to him in a while, told me this later. It was just pre COVID. He said, I'm sick of this, you know, the flu. Woke up in the middle of the night, he's a history channel guy, turned his stream on my phone, said, there you are. And he says, I thought I was dying. And he said, I did not know what was happening to my brain. So if it happens to you, a friend of mine have happens to you, don't, don't, don't freak out. Um, what you find about Henry Ford is both kind of endearing and scary. His political views are just to the right of Attila the Hun. You know, he thought Hitler was a great guy, and he's okay with barring Jews and blacks from public employment and all that kind of stuff. So not necessarily somebody you really want to, maybe. Um, you're going to want to kind of hang with him. But he is a phenomenally, would describe himself as, as a grease monkey, a guy who tinkers with things. And he's one of thousands of entrepreneurs at the turn of the century who are creating these internal combustion engines. His first one's right here. It's tiller, lead, doesn't even have a steering wheel, right? And he's constantly experimenting. Model N, Model T, Model S, Model Y, etc. The Model T that he comes up with in 1904 is designed specifically to deal with really crappy American roads. A road system, this should sound familiar, was terrible. This was just a big country, right? And so the Model T, you see the Model T is real high. Notice how it's got like buggy wheels, real high suspension. And he recognizes that if you make enough of them well enough, you can drop the price so that they are universally affordable. Right? So they're real simple, six cylinder, you know, so it has, has a little bit of power. But anybody who understands, you know, spark, gas, and air, which is basically how a car operates, can work on this thing themselves. Ford is going to, not himself, you know, as a general Ford Motor Company, Ford's got the drive to do this, is going to, in essence, create something called just-in-time manufacturing. Why do we have supply side issues? Because Ford and Motor Company is so effective in convincing us we've been doing it for the last 150 years. Why have something sitting in inventory when you know you're gonna be able to get access to it from China or India or whatever, 
Well, pandemics kind of throw a monkey wrench into that. But just-in-time manufacturing allowed Henry Ford, you can see some of these images here as they're, they're kind of rolling through. You said this guy putting in, I think the first one, no, those are just clips, but you'll see, you'll see a guy who's putting on a radiator, right? You're standing there like Charlie Chaplin with your two, two, you've got a chassis going by, you turn to your right, the radiator's there, you put the bolts on, et cetera. By this point in time, the chassis has moved on, you turn, the radiator's just wet, new radiator's just waiting for it. People would come tour his, his, his factories and he would give them like a piece of chalk. He said, oh, there's a bunch of radiators, go put your name and put something on there. And they would take a tour of the factory and by the time they were done with the tour, they would have a car manufactured, completely manufactured, from the parts that are there. People's are like, this is not an, a, this is a complex product. How is he able to do it? He's able to do it because he has these people working like Charlie Chaplin, right? And most people don't want to work like Charlie Chaplin. Most people are saying, I'm a producer, I'm proud of what I do, I, I, I like hard work, et cetera, et cetera. He had a 400% turnover rate. That's, that's, that's your entire workforce quitting four times over the year, right? So, it, because nobody wanted the job. Nobody was looking at this thing, this sucks. Why am I gonna sit here and do Charlie Chaplin work, right? Ford Motor Company on their own in 1914 say, here's why you want this job. You want this job because we will pay you five to seven dollars a day for the work that, let's say, Chrysler Corporation would pay a buck and a quarter for. We will pay you four times what our competitors will pay you. Right? Some of you are getting close to graduation. Imagine if there were two options. One, the job that you always wanted to do and the place you wanted to do it with the people you wanted to do it and it was ideal and all that kind of stuff and you're gonna make $50,000 a year. Great, all these things are, all these boxes are checked. Or you're gonna put baby seals on spikes, right? You know, for $220,000 a year. Which job do you take? Don't answer that. <laughs> What Ford is arguing is that you're not gonna define yourself by the work you do. You're gonna define yourself by what? You're not a producer, you're a consumer, right? I can live in the neighborhood I want. I can buy a car like Ford Motor Company is gonna offer. Well, Model T's are dirt cheap by the time you, this process gets moved. I can go on vacation. I can do what I want to. Right? America becomes a consumer nation, not a producer nation. That's the biggest shift that takes place in regards to this. And what does it mean? Now, again, you had to work there, I think it was 60 days before the transition took place. Um, again, you know, people are going to will be willing to do that. No talking, no smoking, no English, you know, only English, et cetera, et cetera. You sat there for eight to 10 hours a day and did Charlie Chaplin work. And you did it not because you were proud of the labor, did it because of the paycheck at the end of the day. Turnover rate, you know, falls to less than 1%. He gets people who are saying, yep, I don't define myself as a producer anymore, I define myself as a consumer. Again, what happens to this promise once the depression ends? Oh, well, we're gonna cut your wages, what? Oh, well, we're not gonna pay your 401k, huh? I thought that was part of the promise. I thought helping me become a middle-class American was part of the deal. No, oh, we're not gonna do that. Why should we do that? It's money out of our pocket. You know, maybe stay tuned for finance capitalism coming to a, a decade near you, all right? Easy to understand this population because, again, there's sort of an organic conservatism that drives through this. Life, liberty, and property. It's my property, it's my property, and I get to say what I want to do. If Ford is saying it's my income and my product, I get to say what's going to happen. Don't form a union. Don't go to the government and try and have them step in. Allow us, and there's the progressive argument, allow us to do this because it's in our own best interest. We want it, we, we're not gonna change the work because the work is the work. But we want you as workers to come in at least with a smile on your face and not be throwing bolts and what have you into the doors um, because you're pissed off at the conditions that exist. We get to set the terms of how you're going to work. We are going to reward you, not with labor kind of challenges, not with producerism, but we're going to reward you with a salary, right? This is a question of efficiency, right? They are not hostile to welfare capitalism. They start this concept 
And when the shit hits the fan in the Great Depression, the argument's going to be, what's, what do we do? Well, here's what businesses used to do. They promised 40-hour work weeks. They promised a minimum wage. They promised a recognition of conditions that exist. When we get to the Great Depression, we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that. I don't have time. Okay, uh, Ford's labor production methods from an industrial standpoint, there is no one more important to American early 20th century industry than Henry Ford. Ford Motor Company is a better way of saying it. The engineers who put together Ford Motor Company. Right? Uh, it's referred to as Fordism and what, what have you. Uh, but there's no single, no single uh, um, a company that is more integral to understanding the development of American industrial capitalism in the 20th century. And oh, by the way, it becomes a massive superpower um, as a result of it. And he's a, he's a, he's a progressive. <laughs> oh, I said the word again, I don't know. Um, conclusion to, pro to progressivism, most of them are reformers. And most of them are reformers who are based on what the populists were arguing for. Let's put some, let's make it so that everybody doesn't ground to dust as a result of, you know, let the, let the tiger go wander around. To be progressive, and again, this is pretty common today, right? But to be progressive, one has to have a moral, ethical view of what's right. This is right, this is wrong. This is good, this is bad. And, and needless to say, when you get into those kinds of debates, right? Should there or should there not be a designated hitter? Well, damn sure there should be, whatever. And I mean, you get into those kinds of debates, those are our two visual versions. So um, you have those debates, uh, they are ethically based. There is no answer, there are positions. And by and large, what you see is the arguments get heat, more and more heated as a result. Um, you know, and welcome to 2022. Notice that there is very little discussion here other than social gospel about people of color, women, immigrants. These changes are not intended to help or make, in essence, the average or poorer people happier, safer, or more secure. Um, the Great Depression and the New Deal, I'll say the exact same.